I'm Susan Spar, and today I'm going to be giving a lesson on uh, all the Prima painting. Uh, just a little lesson. This is a short demo, and it's really a trial demo for myself and my assistant. We're uh, trying this as a first time, so uh, we've already had a chance to edit the other parts of this video, and we've had to retake the beginning, this part here. We want you to be aware that there are some jumpy sections in the video, but we hope that as we move along, things will start to improve. And uh, we hope you'll stay tuned for our next installation, which we hope to post sometime in the next month. So, let's begin. Um, I'm going to be doing this demo with a, uh, an extended palette. This is the palette that I normally so use. So, I'm starting here on the left, and my palette runs from left to right. This is opposite to the way many other artists lay out their palette. Many uh, put their white on this end and they run their uh, lights to darks going in the other direction. This is the way I was trained when I was like 10 years old. So it's pretty much the habit that I've maintained through all these years. Drove my teacher crazy with it when I was in the atelier, but um, it's what I'm used to and I can blindly reach for my colors without really even having to look very much because I know always where they're going to be. So for me, this has worked out quite well. So um, working in the corner here, I'm using lead white. And then we have, um, this is nickel yellow. You can use lead tin yellow also. That's a very pricey paint, but it's lovely color. Uh, this is nickel yellow, so it's pretty close. This is Naples yellow. This is yellow ochre. This is cadmium red light. This is a combination, this is alizarin crimson, but it is a combination of two kinds of alizarin, uh, of, of two paints, two colors that make an alizarin crimson for me. Um, the actual alizarin crimson that most people have been using for years and years is a very fugitive color. That means that the color fades very quickly when it's um, exposed to light over a period of years. So they have come out with permanent alizarin crimson uh, within the last 10 years or so. And my feeling about that is that it tends to run a little bit too blue, and I don't like that. So I wanted to get the alizarin crimson closer to the color that I'm used to seeing. So I combine two colors here. I combine um, one is Williamsburg alizarin crimson, a permanent alizarin crimson, and the other is quinacridone burnt scarlet. That was made by Daniel Smith. So uh, by mixing those two colors together, the little bit of uh, blue, or orange rather, in the uh, burnt scarlet neutralizes a little bit of the blue that is in the alizarin crimson, and it gives me a color that is much closer to the original alizarin crimson that I'm used to using and have liked for so many years. This is ultramarine blue. Um, that's a warm blue because it has red in it, and this is a cool blue, phthalo blue, which has a little bit of green in it, so it runs more to the cool side. This is Rubella French Umber, which I really like. It's a great color. I usually use that a lot in creating the cool tones and skin tones. And this is Ivory Black. Yes, I use Ivory Black, and many, many a la prima artists do as well. It has a lot of uses. I'm not going to go into all of those here today but it um, is a very useful color on the palette, especially if you're a classical painter. A note about that, I am a classical painter, um, and so the work that I'm doing here today is a little bit outside my usual style range. I'm going to be working a la prima, but I used to be an a la prima painter, so that shouldn't be too difficult to um, achieve for me, to come back to that style for today and for this lesson. Okay, so let's begin. This is the setup that I'm using. It is just two apples and a slice, something very simple. It's a very simple um, setup. I think for this exercise we really didn't need to get too much more complicated than that. So I'm going to do my lay-in and I'm going to do it on a piece of Yes Canvas. I'm using the Yes as, uh, for a demonstration for a couple of reasons. I like Yes Canvas and I like un stretched canvas uh, for a lot of different reasons, but primarily because it takes up less space in the studio than an already stretched canvas. Additionally, I like to work on a, on a surface that doesn't give, I like a board, some people, or a panel. Some people like the balance of a canvas, that's not something that I enjoy, so I don't 
paint. I'll either paint straight on a board or I will adhere canvas or linen to the board. I'm going to start the lay-in. This has also been primed with just a little bit of uh, gray, which is really just black, which I watered down and, and, um, and, and made a wash for this piece of canvas with acrylic paint. And I did that because I didn't have time to pre-prime this canvas. Generally, I will pre-prime any canvases that I'm working on, whatever kind they are, and with oil paint um, a few days in advance so I have a bunch of them on hand. But this, this should work fine. We prime the canvas or, or just put a little bit of a wash on there uh, for a couple of, we tone it basically, for a couple of di different reasons. But the primary reason is that it provides an easier backdrop for you to judge your values on. If your values are, um, if, your, if your canvas is too white, your values will look uh, too dark against them. Whatever paint you're laying on is just going to look way too dark against a stark white canvas. So having a light tone on there really helps to obliterate the white and gives you a much better method of judging your values and your relationships. Okay, so I'm going to start by just taking a little bit of raw umber and I thin that out with, with some odorless mineral spirits here. Um, just thinned out a little bit so it's easier to draw with. And I'm going to just lay in what I see. Now, when I draw, I draw with straight line relationships, which is the way I've been trained, because this gives me a more structured apple. It's also easier to correct. If you're uh, too, too round and too curvy, it's much, much harder to move that kind of a line than it is to move a line that is um, just a couple of straight lines. So if I make a mistake, as I've done there, and I want to erase it, it's pretty easy. I can come back with just a little bit of thinner odorless mineral spirits and wipe that out and push the line back. Okay, there's apple number one. Let's work on apple number two. So that's this, I think. avoid confusion. I'm going to block in my shadow shapes as well. Now the light on my apples is a kind of diffused light. I need a little bit more there. I'm going to add some in. Because I'm using a north light window and I'm using a diffused cool light bulb to augment that light. So it stays fairly steady during the day because here in Washington the clouds go in and out and that makes for light fading and, um, and uh, getting stronger throughout the afternoon even, on a nor even in a north light window. So this light helps to solve that issue. Now this setup is the same setup as I had when we first filmed this, but because we had some technical issues with the first portion of this video, I'm actually redrawing this, this apple right now. So that you can see how I do it. It's important to get in your shadow shapes. Now these, they're pretty diffused here as I said, so um, I don't have a lot of definitive lines 
to uh, not a in. lot of like, um, definition between the core shadow and the lit side of the apple. Also known as that, I think I mentioned that it's also called the terminator line. Depends on um, who you've been studying with, but uh, that's what this line would normally be called. It's not very sharp though. In my setup, it's rather diffused, so I'm not uh, going to make that when I block in my shadow shapes real defined. There is, if I squint way down, and you want to squint a lot when you're doing this sort of work, as actually any kind of work with art, because it helps by, uh, especially with colored things, it knocks out or squeezes in the color cones on your eyes and, um, and then allows you to see value a little bit more effectively. So, okay, so I want to get in those shadow shapes. I want to define where they are. The primary reason I, I want to do that is because it will tell me right away if my composition is working because the shadows are the bones of your composition. They basically describe what is going on um, and the helps to break up the shapes into, abs into abstract shapes. And the basis of any good painting, whether it's uh, abstract itself or it's uh, realistic, is a good strong design that's basically abstract in in its um, makeup. So we also have a shadow shape that comes out here. So I'm just basically washing those in a little bit. I'm not worried too much at this point about the differentiation of value in those shapes. I'll get that in the painting. I need to get in the horizon line too. This, I want to fix this shape a little bit. Okay, so we've got our shapes in. Oh, oh, wait a minute, one more here, forgot. I think I'm gonna move this back a little bit. I need a little bit more room here on the horizon. So I was talking about laying in my drawings with straight line relationships. There's a couple of, uh, there's another reason why we do that. It adds more structure to whatever it is you're drawing or painting. It allows you to um, move lines more easily, but it keeps you from getting a kind of a gumby look to your work. It feels, um, it feels more structured, like it has bones, bones to it. It's very important in life drawing, but it's also important in anything you do, um, including still life. Once I learned how to how to do that in my painting uh, and in my drawing, it excel it just accelerated and raised what I do to a whole new level. I'm going to pull some of that out because it gets lighter back there. And this is kind of diffused in here where the shadow shape is. Lighter back there too. All right, so we're ready to begin. They're alternative, usually. Um, you want to go to a, a similar color of um, lighter value. So I'm going to even go a little lighter here with some Naples yellow, which is pretty close to. Let's see if we can get that. Still my shadow color. My shadows are not, there we go. My shadow colors are not uh, that um, dark because we have there's a lot of extra light being cast on this from my, um, from my light above. 
Okay, so now um, I'm just going to lay in using as I try to use no more than three strokes to every every time I hit the canvas. The fewer strokes you use, um, the more conservative you are in this in this way, the better it is. Again, I'm going to I'm creating a track now because I can see that there's areas on the apple that get a little lighter as I move up. So I'm mixing and creating a lighter track. Can you focus on that for a minute? Do you have that? Good girl. Okay. So you can see this was my darker shadow color. Now I'm moving up a little bit more in the shadow work that's a little lighter. And I've added some Naples yellow and pulled down some more color. Now if, if I needed more of this color, I would mix it to the side of this one because if I if I keep mixing to this one and I lose the color, then I have to start all over again. By mixing a larger puddle here, I have this one to refer to and matching this one. Again, I'm going to add a little bit more because I want to get a little bit lighter up here. There's some great yellows back here in the uh, behind, a little bit of yellow uh, that falls in just behind where the stem is. So I'm painting that in and then I'm going to work back up into it with the rest of my apple color. Now, this, this color and value and this color and value, it's very important that I find those now before I go much further because I want to be sure that the value and temperature of this portion of the apple is in a relationship to these two the way it is on my setup. And relationships are very important. It, it doesn't matter if everything I do is a little bit lighter than what I say in my setup or a little bit darker, as long as the relationships of those objects remains the same as they are in my setup. In, in by relationship, I, I would like you to think, if you can, of the octaves of a piano. If you start at a middle C, you can go up another octave, and the relationships between C, D, F, and G, the other, uh, the other notes in the octave, will remain the same. A C will have the same relationship to D as it did in the lower octave as it does in the higher octave. The difference is that everything is up one key. Well, the same applies to painting. So if I were to raise the octave, so to speak, or the key of the painting, as long as I retained the relationship between those objects, everything would still read pretty much the same way as it does on my setup. So in order to get those relationships right, I want to work with uh, my background colors and values at this point. And I'm going to switch brushes at this point because I don't want to pollute them with a lot of color from, my, from that red. The red is a very, very intense color. Okay, so for this, I've gone to I have no idea which one this is. <laughs> My brushes always surprise me. Okay. Uh, so for the tabletop here, uh, I'm going to go to a little yellow ochre. I'm going to start a separate puddle for that, separate track on my easel. Well, actually, well, no, it's not part of the shadow. It's part of the light, so I wouldn't actually use the light. And I'm really mixing a little yellow ochre and a little bit of um, Naples yellow to lighten it to just the point where I think it'll be appropriate. This is a little bit of a guessing game. I'm also adding um, some linseed oil to the mix because my paint's a little too thick. Okay, so I've got a nice puddle going and now I want to test this. So I think that's a little too light for where I want to go. I'm going to mix a little bit of raw umber in there to darken it because that's in the same family of where I'm going. 
Now I'm not getting real creative with color here. I'm simply trying to match what I see. In later lessons, I will teach you a little bit about how to get more creative with your color mixes, but for now we're gonna stick with what I see. Now to get my values correct and my relationships correct, I want to squint a lot, <laughs> a lot of squinting at my subject. I'm going to brighten that up just a little bit because I can see that I may have gotten a little bit too dark. So what happens is when I squint, what I want to examine is the relationship between this edge and this edge and compare it to the relationship that I see on my apple on my setup. So when I look at my setup, I squint a little bit, and then I come back and I squint some more over here on my painting, and I can decide if what I'm looking at is the contrast, if the contrast between these two edges is the same amount of contrast that I see between the two edges uh, on my setup. I'm also judging, while I'm doing this, I'm also judging color temperature. I'm gonna get a little bit more of this darker shadow mixed in here. So I'm mixing a little bit more of it on the palette because I ran low. I may have to squeeze out some more paint. Now, I sometimes will go back in and then readjust, often go back in and readjust an edge. Usually edges can take care of themselves if your values are reading correctly. Because uh, what creates uh, a harder edge besides a lifted paint film perhaps, which you can uh, pretty much knock down with your brush, is the contrast between two areas. So if your uh, contrast is really high, you're going to have a sharper edge. If your contrast is a little lower, you're going to have a softer edge. So if you're getting your values and your colors right in that, in that and your temperatures right in, in those areas, you'll have less of a, an issue with, uh, with edges. But I wanted to soften this edge just a little bit more. And I'm gonna go in and manipulate that shadow. There we go. Now I wanna work up into my background. So for that, I'm also gonna need another brush because that is going into the blue range. And I don't wanna mix up my yellows too much. There we go, there's a good one. Okay, so for that, I'm going to mix a gray, and I'm gonna start with a little bit of blue. So I'm using here um, my ultramarine blue. And I'm going to mix with that a little bit of orange now um, to neutralize it. So let's see. I don't have any burnt sienna on my palette, so I'm going to mix a little bit. I'm going to mix some red and a little raw umber. And maybe just a touch of that. A little bit more raw umber to neutralize it. And that's a little closer to, it's not quite raw sienna, but it's getting there. No, oh, bird sienna, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to mix some of that with my ultramarine blue and see if I can get a good gray. Now, at first it's going to look pretty black as you can see. See how that translates to a pretty black color? Nice part about this kind of um, a black or gray is that I can warm it or cool it um, either by adding more of the burnt sienna or more of the blue to the mixture. Um, and I can swing it either way, which makes it a really nice, a nice color to uh, paint with. Now, that looks pretty dark, and obviously the background in my uh, 
setup is nowhere near that dark, so what do we need to do to pull that gray out? Well, we need to add a little white. And now watch what happens when I add that white. You can start to see the gray coming up. And that will tell me right there if what I'm dealing with is a too cool a gray or too warm Okay, gray. so I'm going to add a little bit more white to this blue. And it looks pretty violet here, so we need to tone that down. And uh, what is the opposite color of violet but yellow? So I'm going to go to my Naples yellow, my good old trusty Naples, and see how that works for me. I the violet. And that's knocking it down, but now I'm getting into the green range, so I need to add a little bit more blue to get it back into blue. And notice that my glass palette has a little bit of, uh, and I'm adding ultramarine blue here, by the way, which is pretty much a neutral blue. It's, it's um, a warm blue because it has red in it, but it, um, it's not as saturated as the phthalo blue, and generally it tends to make kind of a gray blue anyway. So I was talking about my palette and the fact that I have gray paper underneath the glass, which helps you to read your values um, a little easier. I still need to test everything I do because often something will look too dark or too light on here and when I get it on my painting it will look entirely different. This is still not close to where I need it, so I need to add more white. Now I am using lead white and lead white is a a uh, very transparent kind of white, and it's a warm white, and it takes an awful lot of it to change the color and the value, I should say, of uh, whatever it is I'm working on. So, um, but this is very good. You see, if you're a classical painter, you're going to like that. If you're uh, an outdoor painter, you may not like that because you need to move a little bit more quickly. But if you're a classical painter, as I am, then uh, what, what's good about the, this color, I'm sorry, this um, uh, <laughs> we have to edit that portion out. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, well, whatever it was I was going to say, we'll just have to skip that. <laughs> I told you I can't think and paint at the same time. It just doesn't work. Okay. So let's just see how this gray translates once I get it on my canvas here. Pretty darn good, I think. That looks pretty close to what I'm seeing up there. So, um, what I'm doing is I'm creating a moat as I work around the painting. It's a moat of color that will help me to relate to these relationships or, or find these relationships in here. Now I'm going to switch back to my red because I'm painting the apple. So I want to pick up um, some more alizarin crimson here and I'm going to create a darker, I'm still working in the shadow color, but I really wanted to get a little darker in here than I have been up until now. A little, right, a tiny touch of that. I rarely use colors straight from the tube. Using colors straight from the tube usually ends up with a pretty garish mix. And so almost everything I do ends up being a little bit toned down. There isn't much of a core shadow. Um, that's a terminator line on these uh, apples because they are in very soft, diffused light. I need more paint. I'm going to mix color. a bunch more uh -huh. here and get that started.
think I need a little bit more yellow ochre. So instead of uh, dragging more paint down from the top pile, I'm just going to be mixing separate amounts here as I move along so that I don't have to keep making this pile smaller and smaller as I keep taking more and more paint down to create the track. I try not to use more than three colors in a mix because uh, you'll end up making uh, a lot of mud that way. Sometimes it'll work out for you, but um, a lot of times you just end up with a real mess. So, I'm trying to be careful here. This is all still shadow color. I haven't moved into my lights yet. And a little uh, palette adjustment here. and grab some of my lighter color here. And you can see it's my brush is nicely loaded. I can get away with a couple of strokes, but not a lot more than that in that area. I'm going to mix it another little lighter stretch here on the canvas, on the palette, as we move over this way, because now I'm going to start moving into the light. As I move into this side, I'm going to need more, I'm going to also need to develop this edge of this apple because this edge butts up against this edge which butts up also against the background. So uh, in order to get all those relationships right I need to get this I need to get part of this apple in. So I'm going to go back to that darker shadow color that I that I mixed up here because that is actually it's pretty dark right around this edge here where it meets the gray background of the setup. So every stroke is deliberate. I think about every stroke I'm going to lay down, and I think about the color, the value, and the temperature of that, of that stroke. Every single stroke has to matter. We don't do any looking of the canvas here, no mindless stroking on the canvas. All right, now we're moving, we're getting a little brighter and a little lighter here. I don't have any bright cadmium yellow on here, which is one of my favorite colors, but I didn't think I needed it for this. Normally I would put over, over here, uh, I'm sorry, over here, um, a bright cadmium yellow light, which does a really nice job of um, uh, making oranges, and, um, and it's wonderful in the light. But these were more Naples yellow colors, and so I didn't add it to my palette today. So I didn't think I was going to need it. Usually I will put it on whether I think I need it or not, but this laid plans. Okay. So you can see that now I'm starting to make smaller strokes, but I'm, I'm trying to bring um, the, this side of the apple where the lights are in, and then I want to merge the half tones. I want to move into half tones here. So um, I'm going to continue my shadow track down, but I'm going to start lightening it up as I do, because obviously as you move into the half tones, the apple gets a little lighter. It has more yellow and other colors mixed into it at that point too. Okay, so you can see how my track is moving down my palette. And that's a good half tone color right there. 
need a I need one that actually transitioned better. So I'm going to find a little stroke that's a little darker. So I need a little bit more of my... Now I've been moving over. down my track. I mixed up a little bit more uh, of the uh, yellow ochre, which is uh, the color that I was hoping to find in my collection here. And I'm going to get into this sort of corally red color that you uh, find in the lighter lights of the apple as you move around. Now this is pretty light, but could get even a little bit lighter. So I'm going to grab a little Naples yellow. And I think now I've got a good track going. So you can see how that runs the gamut of all the colors that you can see on my setup over there. So moving back into the halftone area, I'm going to continue on painting the halftones on this apple over here. Two to three strokes, that's it. No more than that. If you're doing more than that, you're, you're doing a little bit too much for all of Prima. You want your strokes to show. Now between here and here, that, that's a little bit too much of a jump, so I want to find um, an intermediate or a transitional value, and I'm going to just make one stroke there that transitions those values a little bit um, easier. I need to switch to a bigger brush. I like what Sargent said, which is paint with a broom. You get much better results when you use a larger brush than when you use a brush that's too small. So, moving around, I'm going to go to this little guy. This is a pro stroke. Um, you can tell I've got a lot of these. This is a Creative Mark Pro Stroke uh, brush. It's a number six, but again, like I said, manufacturers uh, sizes don't tell you very much. Okay, I'm moving, as you can see, can you uh, zoom in on the apple there or show people what the apple looks like, Anna, please? Thank you. Um, you can see how the values get lighter as they move towards the light source. There's even a little bit of a highlight over here. That's what I'm doing here on my painting. I'm slowly moving over to match those values and temperatures. So I picked up a nice little dab of paint here and I'm going to start moving out of my half tones into the lights. Um, my strokes are moving around the form and sometimes down the form as it best describes what's going on on my, on my apple. And now I'm going to just grab a little bit more of this nickel yellow, which is a little green, great color. adjustment in there. So now we've got one apple down and I want to move back to my background. Uh, not my background actually, my foreground, my table top and as you can as you recall I was mixing colors. This was my shadow color. This was my table color in the lights. So I'm going to go back and find the value in here. This is pretty bright in here. I have some more shadow color over there. I can use the same brush, I think. So I'm going to get the darker shadow color as it combines with that dark, darker um, shadow that's right underneath this apple back here. There we go. 
even used a big brush for that. Okay, now I want to get this apple in. So I'm going to move to my yellows and greens for that because as you move, uh, half tones, and then into my yellows and greens as I move around. As I squint down at that, I can see there's like a ring of brightness in this area, but these areas here are subtly in shadow. So, or moving into shadow. So I'm going to use some of my shadow colors in here to define those now. I'm trying not to make any noise when I do this, but this particular kind of yes canvas is very sort of grainy, so even when I move my fingers lightly across it, you can hear it, so it's pretty hard to totally eliminate any stroke noise, but I use that as a guideline uh, because I remember David LaFell mentioned that in a class that if he can hear his paint on his brush, he and um, that's a very important thing in painting a la prima. If you don't have enough paint on your brush, you're just not going to be able to get those nice juicy paint strokes that you want. Okay, I'm going to use some of this darker actual table color in here which is pretty close to what I see going on here. And then I need to come back and with my red brush, my smaller red brush, I'm going to get the little bit of dark accent that's happening right here underneath the apple. So I'm finding those darks because without those, we have no contrast and no story. linseed oil here, just to loosen things up a bit. Uh, let's try a little bit of red mixed in with that. Now, if you notice the contrast between those two areas is really um, pretty, pretty big, so I'm going to use my brush to manipulate the edge a little bit. But now I'm going to go back and I'm going to pick up some of my mid-tone color and place that transitional value in so that I don't end up with too big a jump there. This yellow is looking a little too peachy, so I want to get more into the green side. I'm going to grab a little bit of my black and I'm going to create another color green. Now hopefully this will work with lead tin yellow or nickel yellow, let's say. Green, you can get a really lovely green if you mix yellow and black. Surprise! Kind of olivey though. And so I think what I'm going to need here is some heavy yellow light, which I don't have on my palette and I didn't think I would need, but I'm going to add it anyway. So that would go, that would go right here in terms of value. That's a little bit better. I think we need a little bit of white now to cool that. Now 
that's not like it. It's still a little too yellow, or a little too warm. I would like to cool that even more. I'm not sure, maybe try this. Yeah, I might do it. Still cooling. I'm using a little bit of uh, the nickel yellow and a little bit of white added to my cat yellow light. And that looks like it's getting in the ballpark. Okay, still a little hard to tell because um, I'm isolated up there and haven't put anything in around it. So I'm going to stop there at that point and then start moving back in from my half tones over. I was looking for a particular tone of green that I think I mixed over here. Again, I need a transitional value for right between these two areas. So I'm going to come back and grab my um, half tone. Now it's time to go back to a bigger brush. Enough ditting around with a little one. Okay. I'm going to test this color. It looks like it's just about where I need it to be. Now, on the apple itself, in this back area behind the stem, you can see it gets a little bit warmer. It moves into the realm of a little bit of yellow ochre, so I'm going to pull from a warmer temperature to capture that, which I already have on my palette here in some of my pre-mixes. So I'm going to see if that works. That's perfect, so we're going to put that in. Too dark there. Come back and get some of the light. Okay, so now over here, in order to show off that little background area or have it stand out as um, the stem area of the apple, I need to get my lights in right here. It's very important to do that, so I'm going to mix that color now, which I'm pretty sure is really simple combination of the nickel yellow and a little bit of white to cool it. And I'm going to see if I can get that in with just a couple of strokes. You'll notice that between almost every stroke at a situation like this, I wipe the brush. So it's a stroke and then a wipe. A stroke and then a wipe. 
My students sometimes joke that I take more paint off my brushes than I put on my brushes. Okay, all that needs now is a stem, which I'm going to put in. Let's see, I need a real small brush for that, so I'm going to cheat a little here because I don't have a... Oh, I do actually have a bristle brush that's pretty small. So let's see. I think it's just a little raw umber. Straight raw umber. There's a little one in there too, right there. All right, now we're into our foreground a little bit and then I'm gonna finish painting up this little guy and we'll be pretty much done with this uh, little demo. So I need more uh, paint down here obviously for the foreground. I'm going to go to my uh, Naples yellow is it tends to be a pretty light color down here. And I think it needs to be cooled with some white, so I'm going to cool that down really good. I was saying that one of the reasons we use lead white is because it makes very slow transitions of color, which is really good if you're a classical painter and you're really trying to get those subtle transitional uh, turns that happen with um, what, well, in classical work we call it turning the form, where you make an object look very three-dimensional. So my light's even cooler back here. But it gets a little darker there, because if I look at that edge against the apple, there's a little bit of a transition. I can see just enough value change there that there's a contrast, very light contrast, but a contrast nonetheless. Okay, getting there. Almost ready to put in that apple. Let's see. This is very cool back here. I also want to get in the shadow color behind the apple, and I think I'll do that right now. So I'm taking out the brush that I was using for blues, and I'm going to go back to my background color, not the shadow color, I'm sorry, background color. And I'm going to just put some of that in right around the apple. Now, the background color changes in, in a setup depending on what your source of light is and uh, how the light is moving across the subject. In my case, it's not getting, I'm not getting a lot of value or temperature change because the light's been pretty steady. That's the one advantage of north light. I want to make some adjustments on the shadow down here. So I'm softening that edge. I think I need to lighten it up also, just a little touch. It's a little too dark right here. So I'm going to move in with a little, a little yellow ochre.
you'll notice when you look at objects that um, as the shadow falls away, as a cast shadow falls away from the subject, it gets a little lighter. More and more light is cast into it as it does that. So I'm going to reinforce that shadow a little bit down there. Soften that edge. Okay, so it's pretty good for now. There are some temperature variations in here where some of those strokes get a little lighter. That's the kind of thing you can add later or you can uh, mix as you go. I tend to find that it's easier um, to come back in a little bit later and add some of those uh, variations in, in stroke afterwards. Those adjustments are good now, so now I can move on to this. So we need our shadow color. I'm coming back to one of my brushes that I've been using for that. And I'm going to, I think I need to mix a little bit more here. And that was basically a raw umber mixed with the yellow ochre to get that shadow color. I'm going to add a little bit of linseed oil to loosen things up just a tad. I think I need more light cast into it because from here I can see that there's more light cast into that shadow. So. A little correction on my drawing here. Typically, shadows should be painted thin. And your light thick. Let me check my angle. So I'm going to bring some of that background color around, I mean the uh, tabletop color around in the lights with my shadow. Going to make an adjustment on my shadow shape. So what you see me doing when, you, when I stop is I'm making some uh, visual adjustments and checking angles with my eyes and squinting way down so that I can see my values and focus on those. I can see that I need to get a little darker in one corner of the shadow here. So I'm taking some of my really dark shadow color and I'm mixing it in with my lighter shadow color. Get that because as the as the uh, you get closer to your subject, your shadows get a little denser, a little darker. Okay, so now I have to identify the color of the shadow side of that apple slice. I have to determine if it's warmer or cooler, darker or lighter and it's definitely dark because it's on the shadow side and when I squint down it's not a whole lot lighter actually than that. So um, in order to get that color I'm going to use some yellow ochre. This is turning out to be a very popular color for this painting. Let's study. And a little Naples yellow. Maybe a tiny touch of red to warm it but not much. And let's see. Yeah, that's about right. Could be a little bit darker, I think. So I'm going to just darken that up just a tad. Let me see if this is the color right here. Let's see if that works. Yeah, that's good. And this, when I compare those two, the contrast between those two edges, I can see that I've got, I've nailed it. I'm pretty much in the ballpark of where I need to be.
Okay, now we're on to the good part. All I need to do is get this edge in and match it to this edge here, where the where the where the end of the where the edge of the apple is, and we're about done. So uh, let's see. I'm going to get in my tabletop first, I think, behind. And that's these colors here. You can hear that brush. Not good. I'll have to use some lead prime canvas on the next time we do a demo, otherwise I'll be hearing all kinds of remarks from my students. <laughs> all right. Make sure this brush is super clean. I'm going to pick up some of my red. Now, I need that darker red color because on the outside edge of the apple over here, it's pretty dark. Now, the perspective from which my assistant is shooting is vastly different than the perspective from which I am seeing the apple. So um, it may not look like I'm doing a good job here, but you need to trust me. Maybe we can get an angle from my perspective for you. Okay, and now I need a transitional value. I'm coming back and getting some mid-tone color. I'm running low, low on that. Need to mix some more if I was going to go for a bigger painting. I need to change my shape a little bit here. So you can see when I mix that transitional value, there's you can all. I didn't blend these two, but you can see that there's almost no. I mean, the change between those two values is nice and gradual, which is really what you want to get when you're painting either a la prima or you're painting in um, classical style, which is more of a layered effect. And, uh, and you get that not by pulling two colors together, but by actually creating the third color. And I will give you a demonstration on that before we're done here. Okay, I want to make some adjustments to the shape of my little piece of apple. So I'm going to choose this interior color. Scoop it up a little bit more. Okay, now yeah, let's go back to that transitional value. Start getting much lighter in here. And then the final touch, the little magic that comes in, is we're going to go to the real yellowy light. When I make this stroke, I can see that I need to get a little darker on my tabletop because there's more contrast where that edge hits the table in my setup than there is here in my painting. So I'm going to come back, make sure my brush is really clean. Now I'm using odorless mineral spirits here to clean these brushes because these are bristle brushes and they can basically handle it. But if these were soft brushes, which I don't use for Ala Prima anyway, I would be cleaning them with oil because it's better for the brush. Okay, so now just need to oops darken that, not lighten it, Susan. And there you go. 
Yeah, might be able to get a little bit more contrast on this edge here by going around and grabbing some bright white and or some bright yellow and mixing that with my white, which might just give me the contrast I want. So there we go. Now there is a little bit of a highlight here. I'm going to add that highlight. Little, little things now would be necessary, uh, a little cleanup in some areas, like down here. I could use a little bit more cleanup right where the shadow, a sharper edge right where that shadow hits uh, the edge of the apple or that light on the table hits the edge of the apple. Um, if you were working on a larger painting uh, with more, more subjects, you would of course be migrating around the whole thing painting one piece at a time, moving from one to the next. Um, but for our purposes here today, this is all I'm painting. And if you were going to complete this little study and you wanted more of a background and you didn't want to vignette it, as I've sort of done here, you would then just mix more of your shadow, more of your uh, background color and your table color, and then you could extend the painting out to the edges where you wanted it. But for my purposes, this is, um, and for the purposes of this exercise, this is all we really need to do. Now I'm going to show you one more thing. I wanted to uh, show you how mixing color, uh, when you want to mix a transitional value, value B, you don't drag A and C together. You mix A, you mix B, um, C, and then you mix a B, and you place the B in. and. Um, and if you've done your, your value work well, then you should be able to see a transition that is very, very smooth. So I'm going to do this with the red because I've got a lot of that color already mixed. And let's see, let's get a good brush for that. I'll use this brush here. Okay, so this is just a short little demo. I'm going to take a red here and I'm going to make a mark here with it. Now that's color A. And let's see, here's color B, and I'm gonna, or C, and I'm going to put that over here. And you can see that those two colors, this is a much lighter value than this. Not a great deal lighter, but it is lighter. I'm, I'm going to make it even a little bit more light so that you can really see the difference when I paint in that transitional value. Now I want to mix a value that pulls those two values together. And I've already got one on my palette, I believe. Normally I would test this, but because I've already got it, I think that should do it. Maybe a little bit lighter on that. So you can see that the transition between these two is very, very fine. It's a very light transition. This one's a little jumpier. So in that case, I would want to add just a little bit more light to this color and make another transitional value. Let's see if this is the right one. When you paint this way, you will end up with a much nicer painting than if you try to pull these two, two colors together and blend them on your painting. That will work in some cases, but it will not work in all cases. And, um, and in most, most cases, this will look much nicer. This sort of even transition where, where I've not blended, but this color and this color and this color were all mixed separately and laid in one at a time much nicer. So that answers um, some, some of my students' questions about uh, transitional, uh, making transitions and uh, how to keep things from looking jumpy 
and, um, and still maintain your stroke integrity. And that's it. So thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.